Diabetes is a phrase, a term, a diagnosis that applies to different people and means different things. Capture what you're eating and measure your blood sugar after your most common meals. So you know if that combination of foods is helpful for you for your blood sugar. If you are at risk or if you have osteoporosis, you gotta take this really seriously. This can be quite a downward spiral. The compromise to quality of life is severe, profound, and relentless. Please, whatever it is, make sure you're doing things to have those healthy bones. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button. You punch that and it's going to notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. That's going to walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Today, we're going to discuss diabetes and osteoporosis. Joining us today to help explore this topic in greater depth is Dr. Beverly Yates. Dr. Beverly Yates, uh, ND, is a naturopathic doctor and internationally recognized speaker and expert in the field of diabetes and heart disease. With over 28 years of experience, helping those who struggle with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes blood sugar issues when they feel like they've done everything else and it hasn't worked for them. She uses her naturopathic medicine skills in conjunction with her systems engineering background at MIT to help people achieve and maintain blood sugar control. Dr. Yates is the creator of the Yates Protocol, a simple and effective lifestyle-based program for people who have type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes to lower blood sugar levels, achieve healthy A1C and fasting blood sugar levels, and have more energy to live life the way they want to. Through this approach, she has helped thousands of people. She's also published author of Heart Health for Black Women, A Natural Approach to Healing and Preventing Heart Disease, and co-author of multiple books, including a book with Jack Canfield, The Soul of Success, Volume 2. Dr. Yates has been featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, NPR, Mind Body Green, Essence Magazine, Good Housekeeping, and so many other places. Uh, and she's on a mission to help 3 million people heal from type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. And today we have the opportunity to learn from her. Dr. Yates, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you with us. Kevin, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. I'm delighted to be here. This is not a topic that you usually hear together, you know, osteoporosis and diabetes. So I'm eager to dive in here and I'm hopeful everybody listening will come away with at least one and hopefully three or four things they didn't already appreciate about this because it's important. You know, this I, health stuff, we don't get a lot of it. I agree. No, I, I agree. And I'm glad to have you with us. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story and how you went from, uh, this is fascinating to me, a systems engineering background at MIT to helping thousands of people with diabetes through a naturopathic medicine. How, how did you get into that field? <laughs> I get this question a lot. You know, for me, I say I went from relying primarily on one side of the brain to the other, right? To me, this really is the holistic big picture. So now the good news is I get to use both sides of my brain. Um, I made that transition because I myself experienced a health crisis and I'd gotten super, super fatigued, really tired. It turns out I'm sensitive to mold. And we'd moved from California where I was working in Silicon Valley, um, San Francisco Bay Area to the uh, Pacific Northwest, which is very moldy and wet. You know, it rains so much since the temperate rainforest that there's mold on concrete. I'd never heard of that being from Philadelphia. So, you know, for me, it wasn't the best terrain in terms of my health. And it really, really made a difference in how I was feeling and how I got specifically to naturopathic medicine was because I was ill. I was going to see an allergist who was doing these shots like every week, him or the nurse, and they wouldn't tell me what was in those shots. And I wasn't happy with just being shot up, you know, injected. I was like, hey, I'm a science person. Tell me the big words. What in the world? Are you? What's in the needle? Like, what's going on? And nobody wanted to communicate. And that did not leave me with a good feeling. You know, like my trust wasn't there. Although I knew the facts, I was like, but how is this going to help this mold sensitivity? I didn't, I didn't see the connection there. Long story short, my husband worked with a guy at Intel who had very similar symptoms to me, who had been very profoundly helped by naturopathic medicine, which I, was new to me. I had never heard of it, and I didn't have any preconceived notions or beliefs one way or the other. I just wanted to feel better. Long story short, after a few visits, I was dramatically better. And at that time, I was in my early 20s. I think I was like about 23 years old or so. And that should be like prime of life, right? You should be feeling full of energy and pep. And I was able to restore and to feel so much better and live my life the way I wanted to. And I really appreciated that. That is what sparked the transition to move away from engineering and towards naturopathic medicine. 
That's a wonderful story. And, and so many people, you know, who end up in uh, medicine and helping people along in their own yeah. health journeys, yeah. they start out with their own health journey too. So yeah. I, I love that, that that's the origin of your story. And what I'd like to do, because you are an expert in diabetes, uh, I'd like to just start out with some very basic information about mm -hmm. diabetes. What sure. is diabetes? What are the different types? What causes it? All right, let's start there because we don't want to assume what people do and don't know. Diabetes is a phrase, a term, a diagnosis that applies to different people and means different things. So specifically type one diabetes is when someone's pancreas no longer makes insulin at all. The organ does not make any insulin. If someone is diagnosed as a type one diabetic, they need to take prescription insulin medication for the entire rest of their life based on the therapies that are available right now. So that's a fact. If someone is diagnosed with pre-diabetes or type two diabetes, and I'll talk about the distinction, then they probably, they may or may not need to be on insulin as a medication. And they may be on other kinds of medicine that help to get them better control of blood sugar. The good news is if you have type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, lifestyle interventions and some other things can really be helpful to slow the damage, stop the damage and possibly reverse the condition. We don't yet have a way to reverse the situation for people who have type one diabetes, roughly about 5%. So one out of 20 people who have any kind of diabetes have type one diabetes. So 95% or, you know, 19 out of 20 people who have some kind of diabetes have either type two or pre-diabetes. Okay. So let's, let's, now we got that. Let's let that settle. All right. Now. The difference between pre-diabetes and type two diabetes is really a number. Some people would argue there isn't a difference. I think it's more of a spectrum thing and there's a difference in the intensity of the immediate problem. To me, when it's pre-diabetes or type two diabetes, it's very similar to the old story of the pot being in the, in the, the excuse me, the frog being in the pot of water on the stove and you turn the water, the heat rather slowly up underneath that pot, right? If you turn the heat up slowly enough, the frog cannot tell it is being heated and eventually boiled, right? That old saw, that old story. And I think when it comes to blood sugar changes, as they start to derange, if you don't do anything to get it back to the healthy zone, that heat's getting turned up. That inflammation is the heat and the inflammation that comes with it is what makes all of the damage that unfurls as a result of the condition. So pre-diabetes is technically diagnosed um, with an A1C. So an A1C lab test is simply measuring your long-term regulation of blood sugar. What's the average amount of blood sugar that you have from about 5.7 to 6.4 would be the range for prediabetes. At an A1C of 6.5 or higher, then the person is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. That's typically where the distinctions are. Some people, Kevin, would argue that there's such a thing as um, type 3 diabetes, which is often thought to be some of the blood sugar dysregulations that often precede the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Because there's quite a few people who have Alzheimer's disease as a form of dementia, and they often have a story, a clinical path where they started out with these changes in their blood sugar. Um, so everyone needs to take this seriously. What I've seen both uh, personally and professionally is for Alzheimer's, for instance, sometimes people are only in the realm of pre-diabetes. They never get to a true diagnosis of type two diabetes and they show up with Alzheimer's. So anyone who's feeling like, oh, I just have prediabetes, I'm okay. You need to be taking that seriously. This stuff is no joke. It's real. The damage is, is relentless. And, and in terms of uh, at the beginning of the explanation of diabetes, you use the word insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some people aren't familiar with what insulin is. So can we, yeah. can we walk through and explain what insulin is? Maybe if they've heard the words uh, insulin resistance before, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could we break that down? Sure, let's break it down. So insulin is a hormone in the body. And a lot of people forget that insulin is a hormone. They think only estrogen and testosterone are hormones. Insulin, my friends, is a hormone. And it does the powerful things we expect from hormones, right? It goes in your pancreas is the organ that makes insulin. Insulin goes and is in your released into your bloodstream when you eat. You will get a small amount if you eat a meal that doesn't contain much in the way of carbs. You'll get a bigger amount of insulin released if you eat more carbohydrates. That's not to demonize a food. Carbs bring great nutrients with them. The issue is nutrient density, right? But when we're talking about insulin, what does it do? It grabs up our blood sugar, another name for blood sugar is glucose, and allows that energy, that glucose, the blood sugar, to get into the cell and become actual energy. When the cell has more than it needs of insulin trying to grab up the blood sugar, 
it's going to store that energy potential as fat. So either it's using the energy right now or it's stored as fat. That's how the process works. So in the case of insulin, if that process is working as described without any complications, all is well. When there's a, 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 a hiccup, a hitch in the, in the giddy long, however you want to say that, the problem then becomes that insulin is not as effective in that relationship with glucose, with your blood sugar, and it starts to have a resistance phenomenon. So the insulin loses its normal natural sensitivity to do its job. It becomes less and less effective. And so clinically, we talk about that as being insulin resistant. That's what it means. It's just not as effective and efficient. So instead of it being one-to-one, -one, you know, it goes down by, by percents. I don't want to get lost in the math, but that's really what we're talking about. And, and in terms of rising blood glucose, mm -hmm. what are the contributors to that? Is it just the consumption of <laughs> carbohydrates? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is a nuanced conversation, Kevin. So the stereotypical thing um, that people assume is someone says, oh, I have type two diabetes or if I have prediabetes, they assume that people have partied their way there. They're thinking lots and lots of sugary sodas and um, cakes and cookies and pies and sweets and chips and chips and more chips, right? However, there are people who show up, particularly with prediabetes, for whom, or type 2 diabetes, depending on what, at what point on their journey they're, they're actually diagnosed, that didn't party their way there. It's a complete accident, right? So other ways you could show up with prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, or if you have a sleep disorder of any kind, particularly sleep apnea, that's a classic on-ramp. Another could be chronic unrelieved stress. Certainly the current situation with people trying to um, find their way through this viral threat for everyone with the pandemic, other things that are um, dislocations, people's family relationships, jobs, uh, transportation, whatever might be affecting folks. The chronic level of stress that many people are feeling is just astronomic. I am certain on the other side of the pandemic, there will be more people with blood sugar dysregulation because they've been having to deal with the pressures of this kind of stress. Why would stress be such a factor? Stress is a factor because it releases a stress hormone called cortisol, along with a um, hormone slash neurotransmitter called adrenaline. So just know this, when you are stressed, your body puts you into superhero mode, right? You're a superwoman, you're Superman in that moment. Well, it's supposed to be temporary. You know, back in the day, hundreds, thousands of years ago, humans sometimes needed to flee. We talk about fight or flight. That's what it's about. So you can get out of danger or lift the car off the loved one, whatever it might've been, move the boulder from the cave. I don't know, but whatever made sense. Now, when we get stressed and pressured, we don't have those physical exertions. We're not running from anything. We're not lifting the car off the loved one or pushing the boulder, right? Our muscles, our big muscles that use so much blood sugar, they're not doing anything. Big muscles that move stuff. We're going to talk about that. It's osteoporosis, but that's going to be our connection to this conversation about diabetes issues. So with that, you know, insulin resistance, you're sitting all the time, you're stressed. This is a recipe for a problem. It also means you're not moving those big muscles. Those big bones that are attached, those big muscles aren't getting squeezed. They don't get the message to build you a better bone and to keep that remodeling and conversion process that needs to happen for bone health. Absolutely. And I, I, I do want to come back to that in just a minute, but what are, so, so what are some of the complications that come with diabetes? Boy, oh boy, you know, <laughs> it's really nasty. It's, it's interesting how devastating this can be because at, at first glance, it doesn't seem like much, but compared to some other chronic illnesses, this one has the ability to take away your life in a way that is so insidious and just flat out sneaky because your blood goes everywhere. Your blood circulation goes all around your body, right? Um, when there's compromises in that blood circulation because of this insulin resistance issue we talked about, you are affected in every possible way. And some of the complications include reduction in vision, loss of vision, blindness. That's one. Another complication pathway can be reduced sensation in your nerves, especially the long, the, the, the end points of circulation, as we call them in your body, your fingertips, your nose, your ears, your pelvic floor, um, your clitoris, your penis, your toes, your feet, all these are all endpoint circulations before things turn it back around to come to your heart. That's going to be affected, right? So people's ability to have sexual pleasure and to enjoy and to perform is compromised. That isn't often talked about when we're talking about blood sugar stuff. Kidney function, the kidneys do not like high blood sugar at all. They don't like lots of extra glucose. So that gets compromised. And sometimes people wind up with chronic kidney disease and or frank kidney failure, and therefore they go to dialysis. 
Some people there, because of that loss of nerve sensation, they also get peripheral neuropathy, either where they start to lose sensation and go numb, or they get tingly, prickly, really annoying stabbing pains all the time here and there, right? It, it can go either way or a mix of the, the two. There's other compromises as well. Sometimes a person's skin um, becomes really compromised. And if they get a, what seems like a simple injury, they don't heal well. They have slow wound healing. People's feet can get ulcered. And you would think if you had an ulcer in your foot, you'd feel it and you'd know it. But because of the interaction with the nervous system, people don't get that same feedback. So they could have a simple, seemingly simple injury to the foot. It doesn't heal well. Now it becomes much more complicated and infected. And their response to what would be in a normal person's body, an easy healing response is so compromised. The immune system's not doing its job. They don't heal. And then it becomes secondary infections, you know, yet more infect. I mean, it's just, it's just not good. It's not good. And Sadly, for some people, their circulation is so compromised, especially in the lower part of the body. Um, classically, they wind up with losing a limb, first with the onset of gangrene because of the lack of blood flow and fresh nutrients into that area. And then the normal waste products taken away. Circulation is not happening. There's no circulation. They lose that limb. And it's just, it's really sad that even today in this era, these things are still happening to people. And, and in terms of osteoporosis mm -hmm. and, and bone health, what are the complications that can, that can take place there? Yeah. So for osteoporosis and bone health, the complications can happen like this. Let's say someone um, is relatively sedentary in their life, whether it's their job or it's at home, wherever they may be, but they're just not active. Their blood sugar is going up. They may or may not be experiencing um, insulin resistance. They may or may not have problems with their weight. Then the next thing you know, because they're not moving and perhaps they're older, if they don't already have a history of being athletic or moving or dancing, you know, dancers and athletes to me are the same, people who move their bodies, right? They don't have that prior history, that bank, if you will, to fall back on that reservoir of, of good bone health. So they're more likely then to go into the breakdown side of bones rather than keeping it built up. It's like you constantly take a withdrawal from the bank, but you didn't have enough money there to begin with. You start to go into serious deficit mode so then with these compromises in circulation, the bones aren't able to get the nourishment and nutrients you know, that they need. If the person's not eating, they probably aren't a nutrient dense meal plan. This really can accelerate. You need a certain amount of minerals and other nutrients in order to have healthy blood sugar, in order to have quality bones, et cetera. So then if they do have a fracture, now they've got something to recover from and that they've got these blood sugar problems. Oh my gosh. This is a double, triple whammy. Plus, they're probably fatigued. Many people with blood sugar problems, they get on that blood sugar roller coaster. They don't have good energy. They're tired. It's hard to climb all those hills at once, you know? It really is. Yeah, no, and and so we've got, especially as it relates to osteoporosis, we have this, this reduction in bone quality, this force that's kind of working against us. We have yes. this increase in inflammation that, um, that you know, that, that can be a contributing factor to the bone loss. Um, and then- even in type one diabetes, I know there can be that, you know, that can prevent people from reaching peak bone mass. Yeah. And then it can also increase our fracture risk. So um, one of the things that you just kind of touched on was fatigue and energy. How does that play into osteoporosis also and, and yeah. diabetes connection? Absolutely. So the fatigue thing is real and it's really unfortunate when someone's really tired, they don't want to get up and move around. They don't want to move and dance. They don't want to go swim. They don't want to exercise. They don't want to do weight training, resistance training, things like that. Like I've recently have done, and I'm a, an athlete, former athlete. Um, for the first time in my life, I've been doing kettle flow, kettlebell flow exercises recently. And I've just been so enjoying them. They've been very fun. For me, that's a functional kind of movement. Um, and in that, I find that it gives me energy, right? But I know that that's not everyone's relationship to it. You know, I'm a fairly energetic, peppy person. I always feel like I've had the energy of five people. I felt so fortunate, really blessed that way. Uh, I know for other people, it's not like that. They pretty much drag themselves through their days. And the thing about the blood sugar dysregulation is that if you've got any kind of diabetes, that, that, that well of energy might not be easily uh, obtained for you. <clears throat> you've got a bigger obstacle to deal with there in order to feel well. And it means it's less likely you're going to do the things, you know, whether it's the weight lifting, weight training, um, household chores, uh, walking, you know, but the more vigorous exercise for sure, soccer, basketball, whatever makes sense for you, right? Biking, hiking, you're less likely to do it if you're exhausted. I mean, we got to keep this real. That's, all, that's a real one. It's hard for people. And, uh, and obviously, 
you would think that if somebody is fatigued and low energy and tired during the day, that they could then go turn in in the evenings, get some good sleep. That's then going to repair, restore itself, yeah. our muscles, our tissues, our bones, our immune system. Um, good sleep is important, but yes. how can you know diabetes and blood sugar swings, especially while somebody's sleeping, how can that affect their quality of sleep? Great question, Kevin. So sadly, just because someone is tired and fatigued during the day, it does not mean that they will have great sleep at night. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that were the case? Because without the great sleep, then they don't get the rest and the repair. You know, as I like to say, your soul and your, your mind, they don't get to rest and recover when you have poor sleep. And this also means that your muscles don't repair and build. And it also means your bones aren't repairing and building, right? Because the bones are in that conversation of tearing down and re rebuilding, right? They're, they're literally <laughs> destroying as well as coming back together. That is a normal cycle in the health of a bone. And in the case of blood sugar, you know, if a person's on a blood sugar roller coaster, or if they experience a big dip in their blood sugar, let's say they have a crash during the night, then in the morning around 4 a.m. for most people, there should be a natural, gentle, small rise in your blood sugar that I always call the carpe diem, the seize the day. It's like your body saying, hey, we're gonna get up in a few hours. We gotta get ready. So we're gonna make our energy available. Now that should be a small rise in your blood sugar. It, your blood sugar should still be under 100 for a fasting blood sugar number as from a lab test, a glucometer, a CGM, a continuous a glucose monitor. Um, in the case of someone who doesn't have good blood sugar regulation, they might experience a spike at that time. So instead of a normal, natural, gentle rise that still leaves them under 100, their blood sugar might take off. It's called the dawn phenomenon or Zemoji phenomenon, um, named after the person who discovered it. And in that, it means they're more likely to enter the morning than on the other side of a blood sugar crash. So when they first wake up, they'll have a high amount of blood sugar. Their body, if it's type two or prediabetes, is making that insulin, is pumping it out. You know, it's got fire engines worth trying to meet this demand, right? And they don't feel the energy. It's so unfair. It's like, that's why I talk about it as potential energy. They've got the potential for all this energy in their system and they cannot access it because it's not in the right form. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, you've, we've got the spike in, in blood sugar <laughs> in, in the morning. That's the carpe yeah. diem, the seize the day. Yeah. And then once somebody is starting their day um, and, and maybe they're monitoring their blood glucose, what is uh, for a normal, healthy person, what is that blood glucose going to look like at different points throughout the day if they're monitoring that or measuring that? And does that yeah. really, does that really matter? Oh, it does matter. It does matter. I'm always hopeful that people will monitor it because the reality is, um, you know, when you live in a system where disease management is the business model, then you get these perverse situations. So like, for instance, the cost of the strips and keeping the reagent fresh, if you're using a glucometer, can be much more expensive than the actual unit device you would use to measure your blood sugar. Um, and that's a completely different podcast. <laughs> but anyway, if people are checking multiple times throughout the day, what should happen is after they eat their meal, ideally their blood sugar has a gentle raise. That's when you know you've got good blood sugar, good glycemic control. So maybe it goes from say a fasting blood sugar of 85 up to like, you know, the 120s, 130s, maybe 140s. If your blood sugar is really taken off and it's in the 200s or 300s, you've got a problem. And I always recommend to people write down or put it in a spreadsheet, use an app. There's lots of ways these days. I don't care how you do it, but do it capture what you're eating and measure your blood sugar after your most common meals. So you know if that combination of foods is helpful for you for your blood sugar. The thing I found interestingly, Kevin, I'd love to get your input on this, is in my clinical experience, sometimes people have been eating what looked like on the surface healthy foods in combo, but it, their blood sugar took off. And I was like, hmm. And that's why I really got on the bandwagon of the whole idea. And I've been saying this for years. Other people say it too. Test, don't guess. You might have an unusual reaction to something that would seem to be awesome, like say quinoa, blueberries, cauliflower. You know, it's unusual. Most people are fine with those foods. They're healthful, but some people, whoop, there goes that blood sugar. And if that's the case, you've gotten important information. It might be, you need to either not have that food at all or a much smaller portion of it. So maybe you have a big spike with a cup of blueberries, but if you have like a quarter cup of blueberries, it's fine. Absolutely agree. Yeah, and everybody, every single person is, is completely different. 
right? And yeah, one of the it, device, it, the device that you were talking about, um, you know, you can actually get a little device that monitors your blood sugar. You can prick your finger. They've got these little strips. You insert the strip, take your blood. It'll measure it uh, just in a matter of seconds. So there are tools that you can use to monitor these things throughout the day. Definitely. Um, Dr. Beverly, and, and in terms of dietary, you know, overall dietary interventions or things like that, are there things in the patients that you work with that are pretty consistent across the board that are maybe principles or mm -hmm. things that you've come across uh, that you realize are important for every single person? Yeah, there's been a few that are just, you know, consistent across all of us from what I can tell. One is the importance of fiber with your meals. And I try to get people, if they're willing to do it, to have leafy greens throughout the day. And yes, I'm talking about breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, have those leafy greens, you know, maybe cook up a pot or two at the beginning of the week. So you don't have to fool with it the whole week. Cause it could take time. And I know sometimes people are busy um, either with their own lives or trying to care for others. And so, you know, let's make it convenient. So you have that one, you know, 30 minute cooking session, prep your veggies, get them sliced up and, you know, make something delicious. It doesn't have to be hard. Um, or, or fancy, it just needs to get done. You can even grab a box these days of salad greens. I am amazed whenever I travel throughout the country at how easy it has gotten relative to what it used to be to get freshly washed, prepared, ready to eat salad greens. This yep. could not be simpler. You know, even traveling, just get a box. You know, it'll fit in your little mini fridge. So instead of filling that thing up with little bottles of alcohol, go get that box of salad greens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go go get go to Whole Foods or something like that. And as soon as you get yeah. wherever you're going, yeah. um, that's great. And then, okay, so you know, dietary is from a dietary perspective. Any other lifestyle things that are kind of general principles that mm -hmm. you would say that that you would say are helpful for people? I think helpful is to be able to anchor all of your hormones, including insulin, um, and to give yourself the best opportunity for bone healing and bone repair and bone regeneration is to have a regular sleep schedule. Go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. It lets your body know what to expect. You know, if you think back to childhood, chances are your family, and hopefully you had a, a calm, relatively calm childhood, you had a regular bedtime. You probably had a pretty regular wake time. And as a result, you could grow and thrive because your day was bookended. You knew, or your, your physiology knew when your day was going to end, and you knew when your day was going to begin. If you have a really erratic bedtime, going to bed, getting out of bed, it is hard for your body to coordinate that fantastic orchestra that goes on. It really is. And so I would say for bone health and bone remodeling and regeneration and the breakdown that needs to happen, we know that that happens when we are asleep. We have to sleep somehow. Sunrise and sunset, the original, the original bookends. <laughs> <laughs> the original bookends before we had all this technology and lights and stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and so I know, um, just in terms of, I know that you have put together the, the Yates protocol. This has helped a lot of people, thousands of people so far. And I'd love to, could you just share what is the Yates protocol and, and uh, could you just walk through that a little bit? Sure. So the Yates protocol is the result of my clinical experience with all of these people over the years, where we really focus in on the four pillars that make the most difference for achieving blood sugar balance and maintaining it for one's lifetime. And that is nutrition. Nutrition has got to be the bullseye of the target. It's not the only part of the story though. Stress relief and stress management are key tools in order to keep blood sugar from putting you on that blood sugar roller coaster we talked about earlier. Sleep, the beauty of sleep, the restore, restorative powers of sleep are so important because your blood sugar does some of its healing and rebalancing then too, right? It's, it should go down and stay down while you're asleep. And then four, we partner that with exercise and specific exercise. Usually weight training, resistance training are foundational and the kinds of aerobics that bring you joy. So I tell people, what's the best exercise? And they're like, well, what, what is it doc? And I'm like, it's the one you'll do. You gotta have fun folks. If you like to dance, dance. You wanna ride a bike, ride the bike. If you prefer to walk, et cetera. Some of us will respond better to calmer, gentler exercise. Some of us respond better to more vigorous kinds of exercise. Test, don't guess, see how your blood sugar is responding. You know, and if you're on, if you are at risk or if you have osteoporosis um, and if you have osteopenia, if you've been diagnosed with such, you got to take this really seriously. Because the thing I've seen is particularly for people in their late 60s to 70s, when they start to have major bone fractures like in hips and all, this can be quite a downward spiral. The compromise to quality of life is severe, profound, and relentless. Please, whatever it is, make sure you're doing things to have those healthy bones. You literally need that frame, that, that foundation in order to be well. 
absolutely agree. Absolutely agree with you. And and uh, I think your your protocol sounds sounds absolutely amazing. And I know it's helped a lot of people. Um, and I would love for our audience to understand. Um, Number one, where where can they find your work? Where can they work with you or get your help if if they uh, they want to reach out to you? Sure. If you want to reach out, you can just go on my website, which is Dr. Beverly Yates. So Dr. Beverly Yates. So D R B E V E R L Y Y A T E S dot com. And you could schedule a call and we can talk to see if there's a program that I have that might be a right fit for you. You can always join our email list. You can find me on Instagram at that same handle at Dr. Beverly Yates. Facebook page, same thing, <laughs> Dr. Beverly Yates. And YouTube, same thing, Dr. Beverly Yates. <laughs> Love it, and I'll link to all those. Uh, I'll link to all those below. And uh, I, before we wrap up here, I just want to ask: Is are there any other things that you've come across uh, that you think would be helpful for our audience to understand? Yeah, there's one point I'd like to make, you know, as we, as we wrap here, particularly thinking about bone health, which is the importance of eating nutrient dense meals. And by that, I mean foods that are not highly processed. So when you have the opportunity, I hope you do most of the time, eat food either you've cooked from home or if you've gotten it from somewhere else that was cooked from scratch, as many restaurants will say, makes a big difference. If it's a meal in a box comes from the middle of a supermarket, it's probably not nutrient dense, it's nutrient weak. And if you eat foods or food-like substances that don't have nutrients to offer you, you are depleting your bones, your own reservoir. We've talked about that metaphor before. Your own reservoir is going down, going down, going down. You want to fill it up to the brim. So you're going to want to eat nutrient-dense foods. And you might, most people will benefit these days from supplements and from herbs simply because the soils that grow our foods these days, even in organic farms, are a fraction of the nutrient density that our great-grandparents and grandparents enjoyed. There is a reason why now in 2021 and going forward, we're having so many health problems of a chronic nature that are new. These were not something that our most immediate ancestors, our great grandparents or grandparents struggle with. Their issue was, you know, clean water, hygiene, sanitation, you know, polio and things like that just were such a problem. And um, we've made huge strides. So we got to keep, we got to make the strides now with the nutrient density. I think that's the biggest message for this audience. Absolutely agree with you. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Dr. Beverly, and uh, I, I want to thank you again so much for your time. Sure. Uh, you, you can find all the resources, show notes, everything mentioned in this episode over at bonecoach.com forward slash Dr. Beverly Yates dash osteoporosis dash diabetes. Uh, I nice. hope you found this episode helpful and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.